Welcome to another edition of In The Know. I'm your host, Tony Reeves. Today, I'm going to introduce you to my own black history icon. Now, don't get me wrong. She would probably never see herself as an icon. For her, she was just a small town country girl who grew up in the deep south. But the reality is is the United States is filled with countless African Americans who all played their own individual parts by living through the Jim Crow segregation years. So today, I want to share with you the first part of my interview with 30-year school teacher, Jim Crow survivor, and my black history icon, my mother, Glenda Reeves. I I went to... uh I played with black children in my neighborhood. I went to schools where there were only black children, a church where there were only black people. Uh, my parents, hardworking folks, but my parents, Mr. J. Owens was not Mr. Owens. He was J to the white folks. And my mother, who worked for a white lady, she wasn't Mrs. Owens. She was Mary. And the same thing with Aunt Bernice. They didn't call her Mrs. McGee. They called her uh, Bernice, and then there were no police officers who were white. There were no uh, who were black, rather, and there were no bus drivers who were black. And there were uh, places that we could go. They were kind of nice, but we weren't allowed through the front door. You know, like the um, movie theater. And uh-huh. It was beautiful in front. You know, glass, big glass uh, windows and glass doors and pretty handles. But we could not go in through the front door. You had to go to the side of the building and stand in line. And then they let you go into this little dark place. And we went upstairs and sat in the balcony. And well, then we got ready to eat. When we wanted to eat, eat something, we came back downstairs to this little square window. And they always waited on the white folks first. And the, I don't care how many it was, they didn't get to the black folks until after they had served all the white folks. Now, I know you came back to, because I know you left to go to Tuskegee for a little bit, and then you came back to finish up your education in Pine Bluff. Um, were you there when integration kicked in? Uh, I was there. Let me see. Yeah, I was there, and the places that... I couldn't go. I could. Now, it was kind of strange. Uh, we used to shop at a place called Cress's. It was called, It was kind of like the Walmart of the day. But uh, we shopped all the way. They had a beautiful lunch counter, Tony. It was really low. I was just fascinated. But uh, we could shop in that store, but we could not go and sit down at the counter. Wasn't that sad? We could not go and sit down at the counter. And as soon as integration hit and the law said we could go anywhere, they shut that counter down. Same right. thing with the little water fountain on the side. As soon as we could drink out the, the clean, white, porcelain uh, water fountain, they took it out. Just like just like that? Just like that. Wow. Yeah, I don't remember how old I was. It must have been, I don't know in the fifth or sixth grade, something like that, tall enough to, to walk down the streets by myself. But, you know, mother and them, they never, they never talked about uh, integration or segregation. I never even heard those words before. But I, but, uh, and, and I'd never gotten on a bus before. But uh, I bippity bopped on down the street, caught the bus, and sat down on the bus right behind the bus driver. And the bus did not move. But I just sat there, you know, waiting for him to move and stuff like that. And I don't remember if he told me to get off or what, but somehow I got the message I was not supposed to be sitting up front like that, and the bus would not move until I got to the back back of the bus. But I didn't go up to the back of the bus. I got off the bus and cried all the way back home. Did Did anybody on the bus say anything to you? No. Nobody said a no. word. He was, was, was very quiet. Nobody said a word. Yeah. I guess I guess they knew something that I didn't know. 
Were there any black people on, on the bus? I don't remember. I remember people sitting all up front, but they were white. But I just don't remember any black folks on the bus. They might have been at the back, but being a child, you know, and that young and silly, I just paid my money and sat down behind the bus driver. I didn't know, but I learned fast, oh. didn't I? Tell me what it was like going to school in Pine Bluff at the time. When you were, when you were growing up, how, how were the teachers in terms of preparing you and things of that nature? I loved all my teachers. And like I said now, I wasn't the rebellious type. I didn't get in trouble. I wasn't sent to the uh, principal's office. I wasn't threatening or anything. I just did what I had to do. Because everybody, all my teachers knew Mary and Jay Owens. Now, the boys <laughs> probably had to duck and dive and hide and stuff like that. Because they were always in something. But, <laughs> but I wasn't. But I loved going to school. Uh seventh grade, eighth grade. The only thing I had to worry about was one of my little classmates pulling my hair and calling me Orange. Hey, Orange, and then tracing him down the street trying to hit him. Other than that, no problem. <laughs> Joy said her mama, um, Bernie's always told her to be in. She told her and Louis, don't you get caught out on the streets on a certain time at night. To be in at a certain time. Hmm. I, I said, really? I wonder why would they say that? I guess because they knew uh, white folks were going to, you know, try to bother us or intimidate us or, or throw stuff at us or what. Did you guys ever hear, you know, uh, was there, were there any incidences that you knew of when you were growing up with, in terms of, you know, racist incidences with your friends in the community when you were coming up? Mm, no, but that doesn't mean there weren't any. You need okay. to talk to somebody who's who, who some some of my relatives and friends stuff who were rebellious and didn't and would do stuff and while they were out getting <laughs> in trouble. I, I was at home with a me, little mealy mouth little girl. What I know you said that it was weird once integration kicked in. Can you remember some place that you went to for the first time when integration kicked in? The first thing I did was go to the water fountain in Cressus. And so I could drink out of a clean water fountain. That was just, wow. I felt so good. I felt so good. <laughs> and I think I, I might have gone into Cress's and tried to eat at the lunch counter. But like I said, it happened only one time. And white folks wouldn't have, they didn't want, we, they weren't having us to enjoy the same things they enjoyed. So they took that count out of there like nobody's business. So you took the counter out. I know you said that they closed Sanger's, uh, Sanger's Theater, right? Same, oh, yeah. Same well, thing. yeah, as soon, as soon as we could go through the front door and and walk on a, a, a carpeted floor and these big old popcorn machines and, and clean counters and all this light, yes, and sit in those, their seats, they, were just, they, they looked like they were upholstered. Just for royalty or something, it was just beautiful. I couldn't believe it, <laughs> but that did not last that long. They shut that shit down so fast, it wasn't even funny. I don't know what excuse they gave, but I know why they did it because they didn't want us coming in there and enjoying that. That means we probably have to sit too close to some white person, and you know that was Ooh. against the rules. <laughs> That's it for part one of Living Black History, interview with my mother on In the Know with Tony Reeves. Stay tuned as we present you the second part of the interview. I'm Tony Reeves, and always make sure you are in the know.